Happy Father's Day. 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 church family and welcome to Homewood Cumberland Presbyterian Church. This is the day that the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. Today is the third Sunday after Pentecost and we continue our worship of the triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Will you join me as we are now called to worship from Psalm 86. Incline your ear, O Lord, and answer me, for I am poor and needy. Preserve my life, for I am godly. Save your servant who trusts in you. You are my God. Be gracious to me, O Lord, for to you do I cry all the day. Gladden my soul uh, of your servant, for to you, O Lord, do I lift up my soul. For you, O Lord, are good and forgiving, abounding in steadfast love to all who call upon you. Give ear, O Lord, to my prayer. Listen to my plea for grace. In the day of my trouble, I call upon you, for you answer me. For you are great and do wondrous things. You alone are God. Teach me your way, O Lord, that I may walk in your truth. Unite my heart to fear your name. I give thanks to you, O Lord my God, with my whole heart, and I will glorify your name forever. Friends, let us pray. Gracious Father, when your son called out to you in the time of trouble, you heard him and brought him out of the pit of death to the glory of resurrection. Give strength to your servants whom you have raised with him to new life, that with undivided hearts we may worship you and tell the glory of your name through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Hello, kids. It's been quite some time since I've been with you, and I'm really looking forward to this morning so that we can have an opportunity to spend time together and to be in God's Word. So today, I thought we'd focus on the scripture, Romans 8, 31. Uh, the verse says, if God is for us, who can be against us? And that's such an interesting thing to think about. So what does that mean? And um, so I thought about competition and thought about basketball. And so I found this picture of two girls playing basketball. And they are playing really hard. They're both equally as good and they are wanting to win. So who's gonna win? It's not very clear in this picture because um, it could go either way. But say for instance that um, Shaq comes along. Shaq is a famous uh, basketball player. He's over seven feet tall. He's probably one of the best bas basketball players of all time. And he comes along and he says, okay, he picks one of the girls and he says, I want you to be on my team. So if he picks one of the girls to be on his team and the other girl's by herself, what do you think is going to happen? Well, um, I think the girl that's on Shaq's team is going to win. Uh, I think that's going to happen every time. And so in thinking about this, um, I started thinking about God's team. So if you are on God's team, you're going to win every time. God's team is a team that uh, is going to be for us. And, and no one can harm us because God says he has us in his palm of his hands, that he loves us and he's going to protect us and that we can rely on him. And so uh, being on God's team is not only relying on him for now and being on this earth, but, you know, we know we can be with him 
in, in heaven and that he is the team to be on. He is the winning team. So I want you to think about that this week, that being on God's team is the team that's going to be for you to, to be protected and loved and know that you have a hope for a future and that no one can snatch you out of his hands because he has you right there in the palm of his hands and he does not uh, let anybody on his team uh, have any opposition that would be harmful to them. So I love you and I'm so glad that I got to have time with you. So let's pray uh, before I close. Dear Lord, thank you for your love for us and thank you that you protect us and that you want us to be on your team. And Lord, thank you for our hope in Jesus Christ so that we know that we can be with you forever on the forever team. In Jesus' name, amen. See you next time. Let us now join our hearts together as we give God thanks for our baptism. We give you thanks, O God, for the story of your saving love and the grace you pour out upon us through your gift of water. From the water of Eve's womb, bringing life to all the earth, to the water of Mary's womb, offering new life through Jesus Christ. From the tears of Hannah, making her a mother, to the tears of the Hebrew people crying out for deliverance, from the bold action of a woman washing Jesus' feet, to Christ's own humble service washing the feet of his disciples, from the rock of Moses and Miriam providing water in the wilderness, to the promise of our Savior quenching our thirst with living water. From age to age, O God, your waters give us light and show us your love. We praise you for the baptismal waters that bring us new life in Christ. By the power of the Holy Spirit, unite us as one body and let the gift of your love flow through us like living water 
with blessing and promise, justice and righteousness, grace and peace for all. All glory and honor are yours, O God, now and forever. Amen. In Acts chapter 2, Peter said, Repent and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ, so that your sins may be forgiven, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is for you, for your children, and for all who are far away, everyone whom the Lord our God calls to him. Friends, let us confess our sin, first silently, and then with our prayer of confession. Let us pray. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us now pray together. Merciful God, you pardon all who truly repent and turn to you. We humbly confess our sins and ask your mercy. We have not loved you with a pure heart, nor have we loved our neighbors as ourselves. We have not done justice, loved kindness, or walked humbly with you our God. Have mercy on us, O God, in your loving kindness. In your great compassion, cleanse us from our sin. Do not cast us away from your presence, or take your Holy Spirit from us. Restore to us the joy of your salvation, and sustain us with your bountiful spirit. Amen. Brothers and sisters, our righteousness is found in Christ alone, a gift of God by faith. Beloved people of God, believe the good news. Through the grace of Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Amen. Will you join me now as we turn to the Lord in prayer, seeking his guidance as we hear his word? Let us pray. O oh God, by your Holy Spirit, tell us what we need to hear and show us what we ought to do to obey Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. Our Old Testament reading this morning comes from the book of Genesis, chapter 21, verses 8 to 21. Friends, I invite you to listen carefully, for this is God's word. And Isaac grew and was weaned. And Abraham made a great feast on the day that Isaac was weaned. But Sarah saw the son of Hagar, the Egyptian, whom she had borne to Abraham, laughing. So she said to Abraham, cast out this slave woman with her son. For the son of this slave woman shall not be heir with my son Isaac. And the thing was very displeasing to Abraham on account of his son. But God said to Abraham, Be not displeased because of the boy and because of your slave woman. Whatever Sarah says to you, do as she tells you. For through Isaac shall your offspring be named. And I will make a nation of the son of the slave woman also, because he is your offspring. So Abraham rose early in the morning and took bread and a skin of water and gave it to Hagar, putting it in on her shoulder along with the child and sent her away. And she departed and wandered in the wilderness of Beersheba. When the water in the skin was gone, she put the child under one of the bushes. Then she went and sat down opposite him, a good way off, about the distance of a bow shot. For she said, 
let me not look on the death of the child. As she sat opposite him, she lifted up her voice and wept. And God heard the voice of the boy, and the angel of God called to Hagar from heaven and said to her, What troubles you, Hagar? Fear not, for God has heard the voice of the boy where he is. Up, lift up the boy and hold him fast with your hand, for I will make him into a great nation. Then God opened her eyes, and she saw a well of water, and she went and filled the skin with water and gave the boy a drink. And God was with the boy, and he grew up. He lived in the wilderness and became an expert with the bow. He lived in the wilderness of Paran, and his mother took a wife for him from, for him from the land of Egypt. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. comes from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 15, verses 11 to 32. Friends, again, I invite you to listen carefully, for this is God's Word. And Jesus said, There was a man who had two sons, and the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of property that is coming to me. And he divided his property between them. Not many days later, the younger son gathered all he had and took a journey into a far country, and there he squandered his property in reckless living. And when he had spent everything, a severe famine arose in that country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country, who sent him into his fields to feed pigs. And he was longing to be fed with the pods that the pigs ate. 
and no one gave him anything. But when he had came to himself, he said, How many of my father's hired servants have more than enough bread? But I perish here with hunger. I will arise and go to my father, and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me as one of your hired servants. And he arose and came to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and felt compassion and ran and embraced him and kissed him. And the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Bring quickly the best robe and put it on him, and put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet, and bring the fatted calf and kill it, and let us eat and celebrate. For this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And they began to celebrate. Now his older son was in the field, and as he came and drew near to the house, he heard music and dancing. And he called one of the servants and asked what these things meant. And he said to him, Your brother has come, and your father has killed the fattened calf, because he has received him back safe and sound. But the older brother was angry and refused to go in. His father came out and entreated him. But he answered his father, Look, these many years I have served you, and I never disobeyed your command. Yet you never gave me a young goat that I might celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours came, who has devoured your property with prostitutes and killed the fattened calf for him, and the father said to his son, Son, you are always with me, and all that is mine is yours. It was fitting to celebrate and be glad, for this your brother was dead and is alive. He was lost and is found. The Gospel of our Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. I absolutely love being a husband and a father. It was the greatest moment of my life, uh, the best decision I ever made, uh, aside from receiving Jesus as my Lord and Savior, uh, was becoming a husband and then becoming a dad. I love it. I love the relationship that Cindy and I have. I love the relationship that I have with Ava, Braden, and Drew. Uh, I love having adventures with them. Uh, I love everything that comes with being both a husband and a father. One of the things that really bothers me as a father is when uh, my kids are not getting along with each other, when they are having a, a hard time uh, seeing each other's uh, perspective. Uh, I really do have a hard time when uh, the kids are arguing and fighting with one another. Uh, and there comes that moment when they are having those times of disagreement where I'm pleading with them to, to get along and to stop arguing and to understand that, you know, they have uh, a wonderful relationship with each other, uh, where, I, where I will be asking them to, to just get along. Uh, and if they're not getting along, uh, I will bring up the fact that um, if they would just get along, it would show me that they love me, right? Um, you know, if they can't get along for any other reason, just get along because uh, I know that that's what I would want you to do and that you love me and that you're going to do what I ask you to do. Uh, disunity is one of those things that we all have to deal with in our lives. If you're a parent, you know how hard it is when, sibling, when your children start uh, arguing with one another. And it's especially hard as we get older uh, and maybe even still have disagreements with our siblings. And oftentimes those disagreements have uh, things rooted in the past that make it hard for us to get along uh, in the current day. Uh, but as we think about who we are in Christ, I think we must look at the importance of unity. Uh, we all know that we live in polarizing times, uh, but the polarizing times didn't just begin. We've always 
lived in polarizing times. There's always been uh, disunity. There's always been individuals who don't get along and, uh, and, and sometimes that spills over into people groups and we find ourselves at odds with each other and uh, maybe we ask the question, how did we get here? Um, we're in one of those moments in our nation now and if you know me as a pastor, uh, I think it's important for us to read the Bible and then also read uh, the newspaper uh, and to keep up with what the Bible is telling us and then see how the Bible relates to the world. Um, I do believe that God's Word relates to the world and I think it's important for us as Christians to look to Christ for how we are to live and how we are to get along with each other. And so how do we deal with times like we live in today when there's great unrest in the streets, when there's um, peoples who, are, who aren't getting along uh, with one another? Uh, one way that we've dealt with this uh, in the past is by viewing uh, people in adversarial ways. And um, that's not a very helpful way to, to look at the disunity problem that we have. We, we oftentimes look at it as an us versus them situation, and uh, that doesn't help anybody out at the end of the day. Uh, we can see that there's a struggle that will continue on if we continue to look at things as us versus them. There's always been that dis disunity between racial groups. Uh, in our country, it's always been uh, black versus white. And again, that's one of those situations that make it very difficult for us as Christians because uh, we know that um, just because we might be different racially, uh, it doesn't mean that we're different humanly. Um, and that's one of those terrible sins of racism and of how it dehumanizes uh, minorities and how it, how it dehumanizes individuals as we talk about it in conversations. But as we think about who we are in Christ and as we think about what Jesus has called us to, uh, we can't try to look away and forget uh, about this moment. Um, Christ does call us to peace and he does offer us uh, peace. Um, in John chapter 14, he tells his disciples that he is the way, the truth, and the life. And uh, if we were to follow him, uh, that we will know how to live, we will know how to uh, accomplish the will of God in our lives, and we will know exactly what we need to do. And so today, I wanted us to kind of sit and think about very briefly about the way of peace. How can we as Christians uh, relate to one another? How can we as Christians uh, fight together against racism and against injustice? And how can we pursue righteousness together as Christians? Again, there's a, a, a great polarization that, that happens in our country where we, we look at people who aren't like us with uh, distrust or we, or we look at folks who have different political views than we have and, and we think of them as being wrong. Um, but that doesn't help us trying to bring about solutions about looking at things and looking at people and just saying that they are uh, blanket wrong or we're blanketed right. Uh, we have to ask these questions and we have to uh, move in a way uh, that Christ has called us to move. Uh, the gospel teaches us uh, about how we deal with differences uh, and how we are to deal with um, uh, sins that we have in our, in our lives. Uh, the gospel message is a gospel that is rooted with uh, with us being reconciled to God and us then being reconciled uh, with one another. One of the earliest disputes that we see in the Bible is the dispute between Gentiles and Jews. And especially in Jesus's day, we know that uh, one of the great disruptions within the body of Christ was the designation of Jewish Christians and Gentile Christians. Uh, these differences between Jew and Gentile were cultural and they were racial uh, and Paul writes uh, very strongly uh, in Galatians about how those divisions and those hostilities have been torn down by the gospel and that it is no longer slave or free who lives no longer male and females no longer Jew and Gentile uh, but we are one in Christ and so in Christ we have uh, a mediation we have a 
uh, a point where we can look at and see the peace of God and the will of God for us and how we are to live. Our two passages today kind of help us understand uh, how we are to live. Our Genesis passage that tells us about Abraham and Ishmael and Isaac. And then our Luke passage where we uh, learn about uh, this father and his two sons. And, uh, we've called that passage the uh, parable of the prodigal son. Uh, but in both of uh, these passages of scripture, there are some commonalities that I think we need to see. Uh, and there is uh, a way, uh, and it is the way of the father in both of these uh, accounts in scripture, that we should be pursuing and looking toward and finding how are we to respond in our world. In many ways, the disputes that, that are happening in the world uh, can be described and understood as the same type of discussion and understanding that we have when we think about our kids. Whenever Braden and Drew get into an argument with one another, and whenever there's some hostility between the two, or some fraction or, or fracture in their relationship. Uh, part of my job as a parent and part of our job as all parents is to try to disarm and bring about healing uh, to those uh, disputes and those disruptions. Uh, and so as we think about how we are to respond uh, to this world of suffering and pain, and especially in this moment of unrest, how can we serve Christ? How can we be filled with the love that Christ has shown us? And how can we be individuals who share grace and mercy with those that we come into contact with? One thing that both of these passages do share, and I think is the most important thing that it shares, is the clear message of the gospel of Jesus Christ. In both of these passages, we see the gospel of Christ on display. We see the power of the gospel. We see how the gospel is much more than just a, a set of things that we believe. It's much more than truths. Uh, it, it's much more than a single experience. The gospel is a lived thing. It is something that transforms us. Uh, it empowers us and it guides our steps. Uh, the gospel is the message of the reconciliation that we have with God uh, and also the reconciliation that we have with one another. Uh, the gospel is the message that allows us to love God and to love people. Uh, the gospel is the message that helps us understand when Christ calls us to obey that we have everything that we need in order to obey. Uh, the gospel is the message that looks into situations that might seem to be hopeless or look into situations that may seem like they are too powerful to be overcome. The gospel is the message that helps us look at those and see the hope uh, that we do have in Christ. Uh, and so as we think about who we are as Christians, as we think about how we're supposed to relate to individuals in our lives, as we think about the things that we have been called to as Christians, uh, we need to keep our eyes always upon the gospel uh, and how it is a message of, of reconciliation and how it is a message of empowerment, how it is a message that is active in our lives and, and how it is a message that, that affects and touches every aspect of our lives, uh, family relationships and friendships that we have and uh, and, and everything that we do, the gospel has a role in what we do. And the reason about the reason why this is is because the gospel moves us. The gospel is active and it moves us. It moves us in many different ways in our lives. It moves us from being sinners uh, into being saints. It reminds us that we have been called out of sin and into holiness. And so it moves us from sinner, from being known as sinners to God, to being saints of God. It moves us from being enemies with one another into friendship. It moves us from being strangers to one another and moves us into a family relationship. It moves us from hatred into love. The gospel moves us from apathy to concern. 
It moves us from inaction to action. And these are important things that we must understand and know as Christians, that as we live our lives, we're going to have to obey what God has called us to and to move where he has called us to. And just as our two passages talk about uh, brothers who were at odds with, with one another for, for various reasons, uh, we should look at the world and see that though we have many differences with many people in the world, uh, that those differences don't uh, identify who we are in Christ. Uh, the differences that we have should not divide us or cause us to be hostile towards one another. Uh, it is, it calls, we're to be brought together, and that is what the power of the gospel is. Uh, the power of the gospel helps us to love, and just as 1 Corinthians 13, uh, the great love chapter, tells us about all of the qualities of love. One of the qualities is that love is patient, and another is that it is kind. And another is it keeps no record of wrongs. And so uh, as we live our lives loving God and loving one another, we have to be filled with this, uh, this presence of the Holy Spirit that, that has us doing things that perhaps we think is impossible, like being patient and being kind and, and looking uh, towards the best of people instead of looking at others and remembering their wrongs and how they have wronged us. Uh, the gospel empowers us to love in this way. And this is very important because the command to love one another is not a command that God gives us just for the sake of us loving each other. Though, again, that is a very important thing, is to love one another and to be concerned and care for one another. But there's actually something deeper going on when we love one another and when we are unified and when we act as as agents of reconciliation, as 2 Corinthians chapter 5 will tell us. When we live that way, when we live in that way of following the gospel and following Jesus as the way, the truth, and the life, we are not only serving one another and loving one another, but we are proclaiming that Jesus is Savior. Uh, we proclaim that Jesus is Savior when we love one another and when we live together in unity. In John chapter 17, when Jesus prays for us, uh, he prays that we would be one uh, so that the world would, would see that unity and would believe that Jesus is the one that God has sent. Uh, bottom line, when we live together in unity, we declare that Jesus is Messiah and Savior. It is a living witness and a testimony to the grace of God that we have been able to tear down walls of division and hostility, and we are able to live freely in the power of the gospel uh, because, that, because Jesus is who he said he is. He is the Son of God. He is the Messiah. He is the Savior. He is the one who has uh, made all things new, and he has caused the, the sinful parts of us to die, and he's raised us up in new life. And so the first thing we need to understand as we think about the gospel and living in unity together is that when we live in unity together, we proclaim the Savior and Messiah who is Jesus Christ uh, to the world around us. We're also actively loving Christ when we follow his commands. In John chapter 14, Jesus tells his disciples, if you love me, obey my commands. Much like I'll look at my my boys and, and Ava, and if they're ever arguing with one another, I'll look at them and I'll, and I will say, if you love me, guys, just get along with each other because the, their relationship is so important. Uh, one of the things that I hope that they always have for one another as, as brothers and sister is uh, that they would always love one another and see one another as, the, as friends and to see each other as uh, as being brought together by God and, and gifted to one another. Uh, and I want to see that most of all in their lives. And so if they want to, to love me, if they, want, if they want to, if they care about who I am as their father, I want them to obey me in that. I want them to love each other and to forgive one another and to work actively together to overcome differences. And so as we 
uh, think about uh, about that and think about why we should live as as peacemakers in the world is that it is actually connected to, to the love that we have for Christ. When Jesus tells us to do something, he's not telling us to do something because he is a an overlord who just likes to tell us what to do. Um, he's telling us the best way of living and and what brings him glory and honor and what and what it is that inspires uh, us to love him and love one another. Uh, and so as we do as he has commanded us, when we love one another and when we obey his commands, we're actually loving Jesus because we trust him enough to follow him in those areas. Uh, we all know how hard it is for us to be humble and we all know how hard it is for us to love one another. Uh, we all know how hard it is for us to to live in the way that Jesus has called us, but that doesn't mean that it is impossible. Uh, Jesus provides that way for us uh, to live for his glory. And so as we obey him, we love him. And as we uh, commit ourselves to following in his way, uh, we are uniting with him. We are living in the truth that Jesus uh, has saved us. And in the Psalms, in Psalm chapter, in the 133rd Psalm, uh, the psalmist makes this wonderful declaration uh, as he thinks about relationships between individuals. He says, how good and pleasant it is when brothers dwell together in unity. Uh, when we dwell together in unity, it is good and pleasant, uh, just as God uh, in creation at the beginning of Genesis, when he's created the, the various things that he created, light and, uh, and night, day and night and, and the stars and the waters and the animals and us, he declared that it is good that those things were created. And he declares that righteousness uh, over, over his creation. And he declares his righteousness over brothers and sisters, the family of God who dwell together in unity. Uh, and dwelling together in unity is, is one of those, again, one of those magnificent things that proclaims just how powerful God's love and God's will is for us in our lives. Uh, because there's many, many times in our lives where we uh, will have probably very good reasons to dislike individuals or to not be unified. Uh, but at the end of the day, it doesn't matter what excuses we may think we have, the greatest thing that we can do as Christians and the greatest thing we can do as God's people uh, is to pursue unity, to pursue unity in the midst of diversity so that we might love one another and understand the greatness of who God is uh, so that we would understand just what God is doing in each and every human life. And so friends, as we think about these things, as we think about obeying Christ and our love, and as we think about the unity that Christ has called us to and, and the blessing that God has spoken uh, over us when we dwell together in unity, may we see ourselves and hopefully act and work as the fathers in our stories today I talked about like Abraham and the father in Luke 15. May we be uh, individuals who live and uh, work for unity in the world, of looking around at relationships and especially difficult relationships that have uh, great history and great injustice attached to them. And may we be people that work uh, for the gospel, to see the gospel take its action and, and to bring about restoration. Uh, some things that we can do as Christians, especially in this moment that we live in, to inspire unity and reconciliation uh, is to learn together, to fellowship together, to relate to one another and understand one another, uh, to be humble and honest, and to always know that um, we, we're not always going to have the answers. And so we need to make that action to to be humble and make that step forward to make, be a, a positive example of, of love and unity in our world. Uh, we don't need to flee from any discomfort. Uh, we need to be quick to repent of our sins. We need to 
uh, be be quick to to listen to what God has called us to do and to and to obey what He has called us to do. Um, again, these things are not going to be easy for us to do, but uh, they're not impossible. These are the things that we are called to. And so as we think about our lives, as you think about where God is leading you today and where you're going to be going in the, in the next week, I want to invite you to, to take seriously this moment that we live in and to ask that question to yourself. What can I do? What should I do? How should I live? Uh, and I want to encourage you to live in the way, the truth, and the life that is Jesus Christ. Because, friends, he is with us. He has not left us. He has not forsaken us. Uh, he has called us and equipped us to be peacemakers in this world. And so may we go forth as his people each and every day uh, with the spirit to honor him and with the deeds that love him. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us now affirm our faith together. Scripture tells us that by divine appointment, the state and this still unredeemed world in which also the church is situated has the task of maintaining justice and peace so far as human discernment and human ability make this possible by means of the threat and use of force. The church acknowledges with gratitude and reverence toward God the benefit of this, his appointment. It draws attention to God's dominion, God's commandment and justice. And with these, the responsibility of those who rule and those who are ruled. It trusts and obeys the power of the word by which God upholds all things. We reject the false doctrine that beyond its special commission, the state should and could become the sole and total order of human life and so fulfill the vocation of the church as well. We reject the false doctrine that beyond its special commission, the church should and could take on the nature, tasks, and dignity which belong to the state, and thus become itself an organ of the state. The word of the Lord will last forever. Amen.
Let us now pray for the needs of the church and the world. Loving God, you cause rain to fall on the just and the unjust. Hear our prayers for your church and world. For the hungry and the overfed, may we have enough. For the mourners and the mockers, may we laugh together. For the victims and the oppressors, may we share power wisely. For the peacemakers and warmongers, may clear truth and stern love lead us to harmony. For the silenced and the propagandists, may we speak our own words and truth. For the unemployed and the overworked, may our mark on this earth be kindly and creative. For the troubled and the secure, may we live together as wounded healers. For the homeless and the pampered, may our homes be simple, warm, and welcoming. For the vibrant and the dying, may we all die to sin and live to love. Mighty God, whose word we trust, whose spirit enables us to pray, accept our requests and further those which will bring about your purpose for the earth. Through Jesus Christ, who rules over all things and has taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Friends, it was good to be with you today in worship. I pray that you have a blessed week. I, pr I pray that the Lord uh, leads you and guides you and that you are uh, quick to hear his voice in your life and quick to obey what he has called you to do. Friends, receive now this benediction. Now may the Lord of peace give you peace at all times and in all ways. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with all of you. Amen.